morning, everyone. Welcome to Chicago. If you've been here for a few days, you will know that the weather has been absolutely brilliant for the past few days. Forecast rain today, in line with the C2H conference. Whenever there's a C2H conference, the weather always seems to take a change for the worst. But tomorrow, the weather's going to be perfect again. So I apologize if you do see a little bit of rain today. It's my job now to just um, set the context for the next two days. I think many people in the room have attended our awards event before, but prior to this year, it was a, it was a relatively small scale event, um, which took place at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, it was a one day event with the dinner in the evening. And this year we've stepped this, uh, event up into a full two-day conference. So you're going to see some fantastic projects and innovations and lifetime achievement and other things recognized over the next two days. I just want to talk you a little bit through the awards program and orientate you as to what you can expect over the next two days. So let's start with this. The awards program um, began in 2002. Uh, with, and really, for the first few years, it was based around the recognition of individuals. Um, the inaugural award was the Lynn S. Beadle Lifetime Achievement Award. And then two years later, we introduced the Fazla Khan Award. Uh, Lynn Beadle was the founder of the council, and Faz Khan was one of the most innovative structural engineers, um, both of whom were instrumental in the formation and leadership of the council. Um, so. You're going to be hearing straight after me from Larry Silverstein, who is this year's recipient of the Lynn S. Beadle Award. And you can see the other recipients since its founding in 2002. And then after Larry, you're going to be hearing from Anya Brazil, from Thornton Tomasetti, who's the winner of this year's Fazla Khan Award. So that was 2002-2004. In 2006, we introduced CTOH Fellows. And this is something slightly different. This wasn't necessarily about lifetime achievements or lifetime uh, recognition to tall buildings. It was about recognition of the input put to the council on tall buildings. Uh, and this year we're recognizing, and you'll see these people at the dinner tomorrow night, the five latest fellows um, uh, from around the world that are being recognized and the other people that have been recognized uh, since 12 years ago when we introduced this award. And then in 2008, it suddenly dawned on us that any tall building is far more than just one person. It's often hundreds of people. So 10 years ago, we moved away from just recognizing individual achievement in lifetime achievement by recognizing the team achievement in the best tall buildings around the world. And we're still doing this today. We recognize four geographic regions, Americas, Asia and Australasia, Middle East and Africa, and Europe. And I can tell you this year we had 178 submissions uh, across all the award categories, which is typically resulting in about four or five finalists per year, and then eventually the winner in each category. So all the projects that are being recognized over the next two days have already achieved pretty significant having risen to the top from 178 projects. Um, the other thing that we introduced, we have the four best tall building winners, but out of the four winners, we also recognize the best tall building overall. So you will be hearing about this. You'll see these projects over the next two days. Um, but at the dinner and ceremony tomorrow night, one of the four regional winners will be announced 2018 best tall building worldwide. I just want to emphasize this. The next two slides are some of the projects that didn't win the, uh, the overall award, and including the building that we are now uh, sat in. And the reason I'm putting this up is these are absolutely fantastic revolutionary buildings. I'm trying to moderate expectations here somewhat, but there can only be one winner. And really, if you're not clear on what finalist status means, here's what finalist status means. For sure, it could and it should have been a winner in any given year. But there's only one winner in each category. So when you look at some of these projects from around the world that didn't quite get the winner status, you'll see that they're pretty instrumental and important buildings. Okay, back to history. In 2010, there was a winner in the Middle East and, uh, and Africa category, 
which we felt the title of best tall building didn't do justice. So we introduced a new award, which um, we called the Global Icon Award, a project that comes around only every so often that really fundamentally changes um, what is possible in tall buildings. And there has only been one winner of this award to date, the Burj Khalifa in 2010. Who knows, we may see another winner over the next two days. Moderating expectation. In 2012, we introduced a new award. All these awards are now concurrent with uh, what you're gonna see over the next two days. We recognize that tall buildings are not just about design, not just about um, you know, design relative to context, but they're often about innovations that are happening in every discipline that goes into tall buildings. So we introduced the Innovation Award, and the inaugural winner of the Innovation Award six years ago was this project in Abu Dhabi, which has this dynamic skin such that when the, solar, when the sun tracks around it, the, 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 the skin opens and closes to control that, that glare. So 2012 Innovation Award. 2013, we then introduced the 10-year award. And this is really important because perhaps too much of our industry is focused on the front end of tall buildings, design and construction. And actually, I don't know that there's enough recognition of projects that perform. Do they perform? Do they perform as the architect says? Do they perform as the environmental engineer says? So in 2013, we introduced the 10-year award, and this year you will be seeing um, two categories for the 10-year award because this event straddles two years, 2017 and 2018, to really recognize projects that deliver on what they said they were gonna do in the first place. And that's across a whole range of criteria. It might be cultural iconography as much as it is enviro environmental performance. It might be quality of indoor environment. So it's across a whole range of criteria. The next award, Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. And everything I've said so far has been about tall buildings. 2014, we introduced a vitally important new award, the Urban Habitat Award. And this is not about tall buildings. It's about the urban habitat that is created in the context of density. Um, this could be at the ground plane, could be a master, a master plan, um, but this inaugural winner of the Urban Habitat Award from Singapore in 2014, I think shows really, you know, the real potential of, 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 this, of this award, the interlace where when you look down um, on top of this scheme, you see the significant urban habitat that's created through the roofscapes uh, and other places within the scheme. So just to bring us up to date, historically, four, uh, two years ago uh, was the last awards program. This event used to be in the fall, and now we've moved it, moved it to the spring. So that's why this year we're recognizing projects from tw uh, 2017 and 2018. But these were the four winners uh, uh, in October 2016 um, for each of the best tall building regions, and the overall winner was the Shanghai Tower. Let's talk about this year. You're gonna be hearing about all these projects, so I'm not gonna go into detail, but first of all, this is the jury that is responsible for having selected the best tall building awards. <clears throat> I should just recognize that His Excellency Muhammad Ali Alibar, who is the chairman of EMA, uh, was an integral part of this jury, but he was not able to be here today because it's Ramadan, um, so he wasn't able to travel from Dubai. And so he has recognized uh, um, a colleague who's with Pacifica Enterprises on the West Coast, but is also part of EMA North America, Dario De Luca. Uh, I also want to recognize Carl Fender, who's the chair of this jury, and um, this is the second year that Carl has chaired this jury, and the third year he's been on it. And I th many people in the room know Carl Fender out of Australia, and it's been a real pleasure uh, to work with Carl. And this year we have Camille American from um, Malaysia, and myself and Steve, multidisciplinary. We have owner, developer, architects, cost engineers, and, and various others people on the best whole building jury. Okay, 
So these are the four projects that are being recognized in the Americas category. <clears throat> one in Chicago, two in New York, and one in Quito, Ecuador. I'm not going to go into detail because you're going to be seeing this uh, over the next two days. There are nine projects in Asia and Australasia, four in Americas, nine in Asia and Australasia. That shouldn't come as a surprise because we're not fixed to any fixed number of finalists. It's about that criteria of what building could really and should really win this award. And as we know, there's so much tall building construction happening in Asia and Australasia. So there are nine projects. Here are the first five alphabetic order here in the next four. Best tall building Europe, four projects are being recognized, two in London, um, and my eyes are not good enough to read the others, but other places in Europe. And four projects in the Middle East, Middle East and Africa. So those are the best tall building awards. Urban Habitat, I'd like to just recognize the five members of the jury, uh, led by James Parak. James is the um, uh, head city planner up in Toronto and also leads our urban habitat committee. Um, so these five people have done a, a great job of determining six finalists in this category. And again, to emphasize, this is not about the building. It's about the urban habitat in conjunction with density and tall buildings. So here are the first three. Here are the next three. The technical jury, you can see the members um, on stage here. And I just would like to recognize that Abra Sharif, the CEO of Turner International, had a, a last minute emergency. So we're very grateful to David Malott, who is stepping in as chair of that jury over the next two days. And the technical jury is responsible for determining the innovation award. We have eight projects in the innovation category. You can see four of them here. The next four here. And also, the technical jury is responsible for determining the construction award, which is new from this year. So this is recognizing best construction practices to deliver uh, these buildings. The Board of Trustees, who are present here today, um, determine the Lifetime Achievement Award and also the 10-year awards. So you'll be hearing from the two Lifetime Achievement winners shortly after me. Um, this are the four categories, four projects in the 2007 completion year and the four projects in the 2008 completion year. And one thing I just want to say before anybody sits across the conference for the next two days and gets a little disgruntled with us when they see predominantly owner developers and architects up on stage and say, why aren't we recognizing the structural engineers and the MEP engineers and the geotechnic and the fire and life safety and various other disciplines, which has been pointed out to us. I'd just like to say that next year, we are introducing a new raft of awards, project-based, to recognize all the disciplines, or many of the disciplines that, that, that support and make up the council. So that's exciting. Submissions will open on the 1st of August this year, and again, project-based, so it may be that some structural engineers are submitting four or five projects um, for consideration in terms of innovative structural engineering or, or other forms, as well as um, interior design award in the context of tall buildings and vitally important refurbishment award. Okay, final points of order, just to orientate yourself. At the end of this plenary session today, this room will divide into two. And there will be two parallel sessions running, best tall building track and predominantly the, the, the technical and um, urban track. So the blue are the best tall building um, projects and the other colors are innovation, urban habitat, construction and tenure. So you can make a choice which of the rooms and which of the presentations you want to go into. So there you can see the venue plan, the green is best whole building track, yellow are the, other, are the other awards. Here's something relatively new for this year. An audience vote. Potentially very dangerous. At the end of each session, we want you all, every single one of you, to get out your cell phone and tell us which projects you think 
should be um, winning the award. It is not going to go to the jury until after the jury has deliberated. So we'll see whether the jury and the audience um, tallied in their thinking. But please, we're doing this as a way to engage everybody in the audience and also see what the popular vote was. So please look out for that at the end of every session and it's simply texting a single number to, um, to the phone line. Final points of order. Tonight, we have a fantastic networking reception happening at the Blue Cross Blue Shield building, which is right next door to us, just two minutes walk south of here. If you don't know this building, it's pretty interesting because it was the world's tallest extended building at the time it was built. So if you look at the mid-height of the building on the left there, that used to be the roof. And when it was designed, it was designed to be future, to extend it vertically future in the future. So we're having the networking reception in the, in the in, it's a lovely venue at the mid-height of the building, which used to be the roof that contained the cooling towers. There are still tickets available if, you do, if you're not registered for that and you want to join us for the networking reception tonight. And there are still a few tickets for the dinner and ceremony tomorrow night, um, which is happening. Cocktails on the terrace here, and then we're back in this room for the dinner. So if you want tickets for tonight or tomorrow night, you can see my colleagues at the registration desk, um, and they'll help you out there. And if you haven't seen this, every project that was submitted this year is profiled in this publication, which is the start of a new series that we're producing, which is called Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, Volume 1. <clears throat> So I would encourage you, I think a lot of people in the room are, are here in connection with specific projects. So please have a look at that book and all the other books that we have. Um, make sure you uh, leave with a copy. Final points. A whole bunch of, uh, of, of professional development credits. If you uh, want to take advantage of this, see colleagues at the exhibition booth. They have forms. Don't forget to give us feedback after the event itself. Don't forget to share your experiences through tweeting and, and, and other social media platforms. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Steve Watts, who will get the real conference started. Enjoy the next two days. Thank you. Thank you.